Welcome to this, the third and final presentation in the Town Hall Talk series, Food Glorious Food, delivered with the City of Only Active Aging Team and Daily Moves. My name is Andy Lowe, and I'm Director of Agri-Food and Wine and a Professor at the University of Adelaide. Although I hasten to add that I'm not a nutritionist or dietitian, so you can take what I say with a pinch of salt. This talk follows on from Joy and John's presentations, so I encourage you to listen to these first two in the series before this one. My talk starts a conversation about protein, including the environmental and ethical aspects of meat production, and considers the innovative future of protein production from plants and other sources, all of which offer us alternatives to meat protein requirements for active ageing. In a typical Western diet, most of the protein we eat comes from the meat, dairy and eggs we consume. But we also get significant quantities of protein from plant and mushroom foods. And recently we've seen quite a few dietary changes away from traditional meat-based diets. Flexitarians are one of the most rapidly growing dietary trends, but rather than cutting out meat or animal products from diets altogether, that would be a vegetarian or vegan, flexitarians reduce the amount of meat they eat or choose to have meat-free days. And in Australia, this may not be such a bad thing. Australians consume 94.8 kilos of meat per year. That's about a me-sized portion of meat per year. But as John says, as you get older, you need more, not less protein. So choosing lean meat and other healthy, healthy protein options is important. would decline. Many of you may have heard about how the livestock industry has received a bad rap in terms of its environmental profile. Livestock agriculture uses up a lot of natural resources and space, that's true. Of the 5 billion hectares of the world's agricultural land, 68% is used for livestock. But in reality, much of this land could only really be used for livestock rearing. Food production accounts for one quarter to one third of all man-made greenhouse gas emissions globally and the lion's share, or maybe that should be the cow's share, is due to the livestock industry, mainly due to the methane emitted by cattle and sheep. Indeed, a recent study has shown that if everyone went vegetarian, that largely thanks to the elimination of red meat, food-related greenhouse gas emissions would drop by 60%, but if the world went vegan, emissions would decline by around 70%. But it's not all good news. Realising these projected benefits would require replacing meat with nutritionally appropriate substitutes. Animal products contain more nutrients per calorie than vegetarian staples like grains and rice, so choosing the right replacement would be important, especially for the world's estimated 2 billion plus undernourished people. Going vegetarian globally could create a health crisis in the developing world because it's not clear where the required micronutrients would come from if meat was cut out of diets. In addition, some cultures, like the Maasai in East Africa, have an almost exclusively animal product based diet. Meat is also an important part of most of our history, tradition and cultural identity. Numerous groups around the world give livestock gifts at weddings. Celebratory dinners such as Christmas centre around turkey or roast beef. And meat-based dishes are emblematic of certain regions and people. The cultural impact of completely giving up meat will be very large, which is why efforts to reduce meat consumption have often faltered. But fortunately, the entire world doesn't need to convert to vegetarianism or veganism to reap many of the benefits while limiting the repercussions. Instead, moderation in meat eating and portion size is key. One study found that simply confirming, conforming to the World Health Organization's dietary recommendations would reduce greenhouse gases by up to 17%. <laughs> but actually, if we were to uh, avoid processed snacks, that would be uh, down by an additional 25%. Certain changes to the food system would also encourage us all to make healthier and more environmentally friendly dietary decisions. Meat is also an important part of most 
You might also consider some non-standard options for meat, including kangaroo, which is very high in iron and low in fat. But perhaps saving up your weekly meat allowance, and that's 65 grams a day according to the World Health Organization, to consume a delicious steak from pasture-reared cows is also an option, and one which supports Australia's premium beef production. So what about other alternatives? Well, plant-based protein is certainly making some headway. Now, you know, veggie burgers are not new, uh, but veggie burgers that taste like cardboard are perhaps a thing of the past. Certainly the original plant-based protein is tofu, which is very prominent in uh, Eastern cuisine. But also here in Australia, we've had products like tofurkey uh, that's been round uh, since the 1980s uh, and is a plant-based uh, protein alternative uh, and also things like corn uh, which is actually a fungal uh, based uh, protein alternative and mushrooms have certainly been used together with a, a range of grains uh, to supplement uh, diets and give options for vegetarian and vegan consumers. But what we've seen recently is a whole new wave of new vegetarian and vegan options. Now, a lot of these options are really focused around the taste and taste of the product and a product that simulates meat rather than is just a, an alternative uh, to meat. Some of these uh, products, you may have had a, a Rebel Whopper uh, from Hungry Jack's. Don't taste too bad. They're, they're quite a good option. They're specifically aimed at the flexitarian market. You've also had new companies coming into uh, the, the sector, the Impossible Burger and Beyond Meat as well. Again, uh, designing burgers that taste uh, like a meat product. And for the Impossible Burger, actually oozes a, a blood-like substance when uh, bite, biting into. But also you've had existing uh, players within the meat sector, uh, such as Thomas Foods, that are now producing vegetarian and vegan lines. So the plant-based uh, food market is estimated to grow and to be a large uh, market segment that's going to be with us for many, many years to come. Another novel source of protein is insects but they're perhaps not everyone's cup of tea. Insects provide a high protein, low fat, low carbon footprint food source. So why aren't we eating more? Well, it's probably the yuck factor. However, we already eat a broad range of arthropods, that's the evolutionary group that contains insects, including lobsters, shrimps and prawns. So shouldn't we be taking the idea of eating insects or entophagy a bit more seriously? Well, Two billion people across the world already do and eat a large range of crickets, cicadas, grasshoppers, ants, beetles, caterpillars, such as the bamboo worms and the wichita group, scorpions and spiders, particularly tarantulas. In fact, there are over 2,000 species of insects and spiders known to be edible to humans. Scientific analysis of fossilised poo and cave paintings indicate humans have been eating insects for millennia. Insects are an excellent source of protein and are very efficient to produce. It requires 10 times as much plant matter to produce a kilo of mammal flesh compared to a kilo of insect biomass. The carbon footprint of insect rearing, particularly in terms of methane production, is also much lower when compared to the production of mammal biomass. The large scale rearing of insects or mini livestock is seen as part of the food solution in many regions, particularly in Asia and Singapore, that have seen some serious investment in insect farming. And we get an insight in what the future could look like from films like Blade Runner. Here in Australia, insects are also incorporated into a range of new food products. And Daniel Motlock from Something Wild has been harvesting green ants that have a strong citrus flavour for incorporation in gin and other products, particularly cheeses. Proteins can be harvested from a range of microbes, including fungi, bacteria and microalgae, the most common of which is spirulina. 
The advantage of some of these proteins is that they can be grown at relatively large industrial scale in vats using only a sugar source. And then the cells can be harvested and compacted down into a range of meatless protein products. The fibrous texture of fungal-based protein is, particularly, is a particularly good substitute for meat. There's quite a bit of hype around some of these protein sources. And one company even claims to produce protein from thin air. Technically, this is true as the microbes harvest nitrogen out of the air and convert it into a protein along with a carbohydrate food source. Finally, the latest meat alternative is cell cultured meat, which is where animal tissues are grown in a lab. So you're getting real meat cells without the environmental impact. It's currently possible, but expensive. A kilo of lab-grown meat would currently set you back about $15,000, but costs are coming down and companies developing this technology are aiming for a product that would retail for about $5 to $10 per kilo. Billionaire Bill Gates and Sir Richard Branson and one of the world's biggest meat companies, Carhill, have recently invested in a US-based startup, Memphis Meats. The company has been producing chicken, duck and beef by multiplying animal cells in brewery vats without feeding, breeding or slaughtering actual animals. First animal cells are obtained, for example, from a tenderloin. Cells are then self-renewing and then are able to produce more starter cells in the future. The cells are then fed nutrients, the same nutrients that animals require to grow. Richard Branson, who's given up eaten beef, speculates that in 30 years or so, we will no longer need to kill any animals and all meat would either be clean or plant produced. One day we will look back and think how archaic our grandparents were in killing animals for food. Whilst this technology is still a way of being cost effective and there are challenges to producing some of the products beyond mints, it is the type of development we're going to need to perfect if we're going to establish ultra high intensity vertical farms or set up colonies in outer space, for example, on Mars. Protein is an essential part of our diet, but we're now being exposed to an increasing diversity of protein sources. It doesn't just have to be meat. It can now be plant-based, microbial-based, insect-based, or even grown in a lab. These options are making it easier to incorporate protein into our diets an essential nutrient for healthy aging. These options also add diversity and choice into our diets and some can be delicious alternatives to our Western diet where meat is often the hero of the dish. So that's about all I've got time for and thanks for coming with me on the protein journey today. This was the third and final presentation in the Town Hall Talk series, Food Glorious Food. But if you're interested in other Town Hall Talk events, then contact Judith Lowe of the Active, Active Aging team or Alyssa Hill of Daily Moves. But thanks for listening. My name's Andy Lowe and hope to speak to you again soon. Bye.